few weeks ago, I wrote a piece for the free press, which is now reposted on my Substack, about how Ted sandbagged my talk on colorblindness. Chris Anderson, the head of Ted, wrote a response on X, which I responded to promptly. But Chris wrote a follow-up, and the social scientist Adam Grant also wrote a public response, neither of which I've publicly responded to. A number of people have asked me if I plan to respond, so here I go. From my perspective, it's pointless to continue a public conversation with Chris without him acknowledging the core allegation of my piece and apologizing for it. Simply put, Chris pleaded with me to adopt a strange release strategy in order to amplify my talk, which I suspected was a bit of corporate spin doctoring at the time. Then, Ted did the opposite of amplify my talk. They deliberately under-promoted and sandbagged it on their website. And while Chris has called my version of events reasonably accurate, he's been careful to neither admit nor deny this core accusation. If he thinks I'm wrong, he should just say so. But if he acknowledges I'm right, which is all but conceded by his silence on the issue, then decency requires owning up to it and apologizing. Instead, he's chosen this middle path where he says a bunch of stuff without addressing the elephant in the room. Besides that, I have very little to say about Chris's public statements that has not already been said. Jesse Single's Substack post, for instance, was really great. I'll just echo a few of Jesse's points here. First, Chris seems to view this situation as a dispute between two equally reasonable parties, me on the one end and his staff on the other. This is the wrong way to think about the situation. Here are two key differences between me and his staff. First, I believe there should be all kinds of TED Talks, woke ones, anti-woke ones, and just apolitical ones. Free speech and viewpoint diversity should reign supreme. But Ted's staff appears to believe that there should be tons of woke talks and zero anti-woke talks. That's a big difference. I want a bigger tent of allowable ideas, and they want a smaller tent. Second big difference between me and Ted's staff. I believe Martin Luther King's prescription of race-blind, class-based social policy, as he advocated for in his book, Why We Can't Wait, is both wise and at minimum within the bounds of acceptable opinion. The people on the other side of me here appear to believe that anyone who advocates for Martin Luther King's position should be deplatformed. Equally reasonable? I don't think so. Finally, Chris really needs to reframe his view of his staff's feelings. For instance, Chris wrote, Quote, some commenters below just don't understand how anyone could be upset by a talk arguing for colorblindness. Okay, that is a straw man. Sure, somewhere there is probably a person with Asperger's who truly just doesn't get why people get touchy about race. But the vast majority of Ted's critics in this debacle understand why people get emotional about race. We just don't think that those emotions should have veto power over what can be argued in a public forum. Last year, Ted had a pro-communism talk. Socialism is in the title, but communism is advocated by name in the talk. Now, I bet you there was at least one member in that audience who grew up in the Soviet Union or Cuba and was fiercely triggered by this talk, given the ghastly toll of communism in those nations. But would their offense ever be taken as a reason to censor the talk? Of course not. And that's the way it should be. The adults in the room should say, sorry, but your feelings, while totally understandable, do not give you veto power. End of story. Life is triggering. And part of being an adult is learning to take responsibility for your feelings instead of insisting that it's the world's responsibility not to trigger you. And we all understand this like 99% of the time. Why woke institutions suddenly forget this when confronted with black anger or indigenous anger or LGBTQ anger, that's what Ted's critics, myself included, just don't get. Okay? As for Adam Grant, I've asked Adam to come on this podcast several times, but he's declined and that invitation still stands. (laughs) 
there's been a lot of talk about a meta-analysis that Adam Grant sent to Chris and Chris sent to me. But because of the way they framed this meta-analysis, I think it's really easy to lose the forest for the trees here. So big picture, the meta-analysis is really bad and it in no way refutes my talk. So let's return to square one. In my talk, I argued that colorblindness is the way to go, both in our personal lives and in our public policy. In other words, race should never be the but-for cause of your decisions about who to accept into your college, who to hire, who to befriend, who to marry, who to distribute emergency aid to in a pandemic, and so forth. Yet too often, it is. That was the message of my talk in a nutshell. Now, my argument did not rely on social science, purposely so. For starters, there is a huge replication crisis in social science. I did an episode with Jesse Single on this over a year ago. By one estimate, almost half of social psychology findings turn out to be BS. And those BS findings are far more likely to be cited than the real ones. What's more, combining a bunch of BS studies into a meta-analysis doesn't make them any better. So instead of relying on a field that is notoriously unreliable, I relied on other arguments, and you can watch the talk again if you doubt this. I relied on intellectual history, moral philosophy, and recent real-world case studies. Nobody at TED had a problem with this at the time. But weeks after my talk, I received a social science meta-analysis, along with a snippet of a message from Adam Grant saying this meta-analysis was an example of, quote, rigorous research that directly contradicted my inaccurate talk. So I'll read to you the part of Adam's message that I received. Quote, Really glad to see Ted offering viewpoint diversity. We need more conservative voices. But as a social scientist, was dismayed to see Coleman Hughes deliver an inaccurate message. His case for colorblindness is directly contradicted by an extensive body of rigorous research. For the state of science, see Leslie, Bono, Kim, and Beaver in the Journal of Applied Psychology. In a meta-analysis of 296 studies, they found that whereas color-conscious models reduce prejudice and discrimination, color-blind approaches often fail to help and sometimes backfire. End quote. So at this point, Adam would certainly want me to remind you that this was not his full message to Chris. So this is the reminder. The link to his full comments can be found in my Substack post. Frankly, I don't see how this is relevant, though, because nothing else in his message contradicts this excerpted part. Even in its full context, Adam appears to believe that this meta-analysis is the state of the science, direct, directly contradicts my talk, and shows my talk to be inaccurate. And Chris appears to believe that Adam's overall stance is backed up by this paper. So as you will see shortly... These are both very bad, retraction-worthy takes. So there are at least two levels at which this meta-analysis just doesn't refute my talk at all. First, as mentioned, you should rate meta-analyses of social psychology studies very low on the believability scale to begin with. A grain of salt does not even begin to approach the attitude you should take towards such studies, given the replication crisis. But let's forget that for the sake of argument. Let's assume that the field of social psychology were super rigorous. What does this meta-analysis actually claim? And do those claims challenge the ones that I made in my talk? So the overall structure of this meta-analysis is pretty simple. It It examines how four different ideologies, colorblindness, meritocracy, assimilation, and multiculturalism affect four different outcomes, prejudice, discrimination, stereotyping, and support for diversity policies. Yes, you heard that right. This rigorous meta-analysis is designed so that one of the ways success is measured is whether the ideology leads to policy support for affirmative action, DEI policies, and permissive immigration. In other words, affirmative action is assumed to be good and then treated like an effect rather than a cause. 
which strikes me as exactly backwards. Shouldn't the point of a study like this be to see whether policies like race-based affirmative action cause good or bad outcomes? That certainly was the point of my talk, or at least one point of my talk. The interesting question is not whether colorblindness leads you to oppose affirmative action. It basically does by definition. The interesting question is whether policies like race-based affirmative action lead to bad outcomes like more discrimination. That would be an interesting question. This meta-analysis doesn't even ask that question, much less answer it. Because of the strange way it it is structured, it's just not designed to even weigh in on the claims that I make in my talk. And similarly, Adam Grant, he hangs his argument on the paper's claim that, quote, multiculturalism is more consistently associated with improved intergroup relations than any identity-blind ideology. In other words, this paper argues that multiculturalism is better than colorblindness. So in order for me to be right, Adam is saying, I'd have to show the opposite, that the colorblind approach has greater efficacy than the multicultural approach. And I didn't do that in my talk, so game, set, match, right? Well, not exactly. It completely depends on how this paper defines multiculturalism. So they define multiculturalism as, quote, acknowledging cultural differences by learning about, maintaining, or valuing them. So the problem for Grant is that I totally support this kind of multiculturalism. I support learning about cultural differences and valuing them. And there's really not a word of my talk that suggests otherwise. I'm not against learning about and celebrating cultural differences. I'm against race essentialism and policies that discriminate on the basis of race. I'm not coming for your school assembly on Diwali or Ramadan or Chinese New Year. That stuff is awesome. I'm coming for your race-based affirmative action, race-based emergency aid, and so forth. Those policies are awful. And again, this rigorous meta-analysis doesn't even ask what the effects of those kinds of policies are. So besides this conceptually confused and irrelevant meta-analysis, Adam cites some other studies which are paywalled. And because I really don't want to spend more time on this, I'm not going to be reading or addressing those here. If Adam wants to hang his argument on those other studies instead, then perhaps I'll look at them in the future. But for now, I hope I've shown that the efforts to debunk my talk with silly social science are in general deranged. This is what I would call working backwards from a predetermined conclusion. So in sum, let me say that I don't think either Chris or Adam has issued the kinds of retractions and apologies that are truly merited by this situation. But at this point, I do not expect those to be forthcoming. Thanks for watching. <laughs>